Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. Uh, it is Wednesday. We are here to go over week 15 in the NFL. Um, as usual, uh, we've got our early week disclaimers. Um, we got some noise going on here. You see kind of a bunch of red numbers over here, uh, just in the quarterback room. Um, we've still got some questions about some guy's health. Uh, so we'll have to, uh, just kind of keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. Um, but as of right now, we've got, um, you know, with the Saturday slate, uh, a lot of the, the models across the industry have already started to, to put up their stuff. So, um, trying to get this one out a little bit earlier this week. Um, that said, we are only going to go be going over the main slate here, uh, just 10 games on the main, and we got a, a pretty decent split, finally, I uh, wish they'd do this more often, and more often, you know, being like every week, uh, but we have a 6-4 split here, and I think this makes for really interesting decisions, it opens you up for, um, you know, more late swap decisions that you can make going into the afternoon. Um, and, and this week in particular, I think we've got some interesting games down here that would allow us to take advantage of that uh, in some scenarios, right? I think we could, you know, for the most part, like get to our defenses or whatever uh, up in the up in the early games, just kind of as usual. And then in the later, the you know, latter games here um, in the afternoon, we can uh, use the early performance uh, and, and really swap into uh, a bunch of different players um, in in a lot of different spots I think that that we could really attack certainly in the Tennessee Chargers game um, in the New England Vegas game I think is a little bit sneaky here um, I think we could you know this could be one of the games that we end up seeing like a, some random pieces of, uh, from New England uh, or whatever, uh, uh, Mac Hollins or something, <laughs> end up you know, pushing you well into the cash line and, and really launching you up um, up leaderboards and finishing positions uh, start to increase a bit with you know some guys in these later games, probably less so in the Arizona-Denver game, of course, but uh, also have um, some health questions down here in the, in the Cincy-Tampa game. So um, without further ado, let's, let's just kind of get into it. That's kind of the brief slate overview. Um, as we've done the last several weeks, do just want to kind of get our bearings a little bit um, and just look at where initial ownership is coming in uh, on the quarterbacks. And that, that a lot of time, at least for me, helps dictate where I want to start my research and, and originally look um, for potential stacks, right? And where we could find some potentially... Uh, unowned value, right? Some overlooked value from some guys. Um, and this week, you know, as is kind of normal, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're pretty spread out. Um, up at the top here, we've got Mahomes, Hertz, uh, naturally Justin Herbert as well. Uh, kind of seeing most of the ownership. Um, Dak a little bit lower is also pulling in, uh, you know, some, some early numbers, which I think is warranted pretty much across the board up here. Um, you know, naturally, Mahomes against Houston in a very pass-heavy offense. Uh, it's going to be something we want to take a look at. Uh, of course, Jalen Hurts in a very high-powered offense um, against Chicago in a pretty bad defense. Also something we probably want to take a look at. Those two guys very clearly leading the way in value score here. Um, and at their price tags, it's usually pretty hard to do. But... Uh, I think that's. Um, I think most of it makes sense. We'll get into the individual games and talk about it a little more. But for the most part, that kind of makes sense. Justin Herbert, of course, getting Tennessee's defense makes sense as well, right? Um, Burrow down here getting a, a bit stiffer defense in Tampa, uh, but we've once again got health questions for the Cincinnati pass catchers. Um, so that could markedly affect Joe Burrow uh, and his ownership and how much and really how we want to attack him. Um, fields up here at the top, really not seeing anything. And I think this is a really, really good spot for, 
for Fields, as a matter of fact, is a contrarian play to get off of some of this Jalen Hurts um, and natural Philly ownership that we're going to see. So uh, I think this is a pretty decent pivot spot up here in the upper range. I think that's fine. But, of course, Dak is going to lead the way in kind of the, the mid-6K range. We don't really have anybody down here that we can play. Um, really, what, these are the only two guys in the $6,000 price range this week, Dak and Trev, um, down here at the lower sixes. I mean, we've still got Kyler here in the projections. He'll, of course, be out, right? Um, so that's why we're going to see, just based on certain constructions, if guys want to go a little bit of a different direction, uh, you'll see them filter down to Dak. So I, I think by the end of the week, we'll probably see Dak's ownership steam a little bit because we've seen that Jacksonville uh, can really give it up to um, a strong offense. Now, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll get into uh, the Dallas-Jacksonville game when we get there, but... Um, the ownership, at least as of now, you know, it, it does kind of make sense, right? Down in the sort of 5K range, you've got a bunch of guys in here. Um, we have Mike White health concerns. Uh, we have, who else do we have? I mean, we've got Desmond Ritter, actually, down here at 5,200. He's going to be starting for Atlanta because Mariota is out. Of course, we have Russell Wilson concerns. Um, so it's could be Brett Rippon. We, we're not totally sure yet. We also have Kenny Pickett health concerns, right? Could be Trubisky here. Um, once again, as I mentioned, it will be Colt McCoy against Denver. Probably not something we want to go out of our way to target, right? But, um, you know, so a lot of different stuff we've got going on here. And that, once again, will yield to some uh, pretty spread out ownership. So that said, in a 10-game slate, um, we, we would normally be kind of starving for some really, really good plays. Uh, this week, I think we're a little spread out. I think there's some sneaky stuff. Later in the season, or when we get to the latter parts of the season, rather, um, I think we we see the market, especially in the betting markets, certainly in, in DFS as well, you know, everybody is, is becoming a bit sharper uh, now that we have all, we've all got data and et cetera that we've been looking at for the last, you know, four months see here. So um, we're, you know, most of the the industry is pretty familiar with these teams, right? Pretty familiar with the players. And I think as we get to the latter weeks in the season, then yeah, that could allow us to uh, try and exploit um, some of those tendencies of the industry, right? And not just I mean, naturally, we want to avoid super popular spots, just in general, in tournaments at least. Um, but I think we can, you know, get a little more, a little bit more balanced. You know, mix in some of these popular plays, uh, and then try and kind of pivot a little bit uh, in some spots. So, um, so that said, you know, we are going to be kind of spread out. Once again, disclaimer, uh, we have early week noise, so don't put a whole hell of a lot of stock into these numbers. Uh, I did update them, as a matter of fact, last night, Tuesday night, um, so with, with very early runs. And we, I noticed we had quite a bit of, of, uh, of noise coming through. And as a matter of fact, I've um, kind of, on the back end, updated some of the numbers. So what I have here is going to display a little bit differently than what's uploaded on the site but um you know we'll have uh some pretty frequent updates over the next couple of days um so once again we are just going to go over the main slate here um uh, we'll probably have you know various content takes from from the rest of the guys up as far as the, the saturdays and the showdowns and all that stuff but uh here we'll just kind of take care of the main slate and we'll get into it so Philly and Chicago, um, I kind of talked about it a little bit already, right? We've got uh, a pretty bad defense over here in Chicago. Uh, they've been pretty bad all season, and their offense has, over the last several weeks, kind of picked it up a little bit, starting to figure it out. Um, and that could mean that Philly over here uh, you know, could be in a bit of a dogfight. I mean, they're laying nine. Uh, I think the number, I made the number nine as well. Uh, so I think it's, they should be laying a, a pretty stiff figure here, of course. Um, but Philly's actually got a pretty significant weakness on the ground. 
And I think on the other side, we'll get to that in a second, it could lead to some availability for Chicago, um, maybe not fully compete, but to make it uh, a little bit interesting, you know, to say the least. So that said, uh, we very well may need Philly to score here a little bit, and that's really kind of why we see Jalen Hurts popping so hard. Um, his weapons really not so much, though, right? Um, we're seeing Miles Sanders, of course, coming off the really big week last week, 6,500, slightly more elevated ownership, at least in early runs. Um, seeming Seems a bit high at the moment, but this is a really balanced offense here in Philly with weapons all over the place, right? A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith in a passing game with some Quez Watkins, but they've got Miles Sanders, Kenneth Gainwell can spell a little bit, and of course Jalen Hurts on the ground too. So um, a lot of different weapons here. So I would, like, I, I definitely don't like chasing big performances, and I, I certainly don't like doing it when they also get a price bump and an ownership bump as well. Um, it's just harder to differentiate. In, in those instances, right? So that doesn't mean I don't think these guys are, are bad plays uh, by any means, right? Because once again, Chicago is super attackable on the ground. I think the best way to approach this is to really sort out the potential game scripts. Um, I would probably prefer just to get to Chicago on the other side. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec. And then run it back with some Philly pieces here. But this number is actually quite high. Let's get rid of all of that crap. Um, into betting markets. And let's see. I'm, I'm kind of lost over here. Uh, what are we? We're at 48 and a half, right? With Philly land nine. Um, so obviously we know Philly can score, and we know that they could put up 28, 29 points here. But I bet it would look a little bit surprising when we do this math that Chicago could also put up, you know, three touchdowns. And, and where would that come from? Where would all this scoring come from? Um, well, of course, we can we can target A.J. Brown, 8,000. Once again, for his role, for the pass catchers in the offense, especially when they get a spot like they do have here against Chicago uh, where they can just use the running game, um, they're super, super efficient in the running game. So they don't necessarily need to pass all that time, uh, all the time. So, as I mentioned before, in general, I think A.J. Brown's price at 8000 Devontae Smith at 6400 are probably overpriced. Um, but that said, at low ownership, you can obviously get to them. We saw what they did to Tennessee just a couple weeks ago. And and mixing them in with, with Jalen Hurts, obviously capitalizing on some of that rushing upside. Um, it's, a, it's a strong stack, for sure. This is probably the best team in the NFL at the moment. Um, you know, I, and I don't think we'd get, you know, many differing opinions on that. So, uh, it's a good spot for Philly and you can get to their entire offense. I would personally, I'll probably lay off of the Miles Sanders chasing a little bit, um, and minimize or cap my exposures to the AJ Brown types of plays. I think I'd once again prefer to get to Devontae Smith. Gee, he's 1600 cheaper. Um, so if I'm playing stacks here, I think one-offs are fine, right? But if I'm playing stacks, I'd prefer something like a Hertz, uh, Devontae Smith type of play to get some rushing upside, uh, but also expose myself a little bit to the passing game as well. Um, Eagles defense, 3,900. I probably want to stay off of this here. Like I said, they've got a significant weakness on the ground, and I think that makes Justin Fields a really, really good play. Uh, at 4% ownership, I mean, he was 15% a few weeks ago. Have we just forgotten that, that Fields is is probably the best pure rushing quarterback in the league now? That's sort of, um, you know, like Lamar, right? Once again, Chicago's passing offense is, you know, leaves quite a bit to be desired, right? And now that they've got, um, you know, their number one receiver, Darnell Mooney, he's hurt. I mean, they've got... They're just filtering in Chase Claypool. They've still got EQ St. Brown here, but now it's the Dante Pettis show that they're just going to sort of filter in uh, or funnel in, I suppose. Um, really, like the best receiving piece, as has been the case for the past like month and a half, is Cole Komet. So um, I think it's an okay spot to 
includes a little bit of passing exposure, passing game exposure here. If you're playing a rushing quarterback, uh, wouldn't you know, double or triple stack a rush heavy quarterback like a Fields or a Hertz necessarily? Um, you know, without it being just a killer killer spot. But once again, I think the weaknesses that are most exploitable on both sides here for Philly and Chicago are the running games. So um, I think I'd rather get to field 7,400, save eight, 900 bucks or whatever off of Hertz. Uh, I think that's really strong. Play him with a Cole Komet at 4,000. We're kind of starving for some tight end value this week. I think this is a decent play at pretty low ownership. David Montgomery at 63, I generally don't like playing at higher ownership, but at 10%, I think it's all right. Uh, I have upside concerns for him, certainly in tournaments. Uh, but I don't think it's a, a poor play by any means. So uh, Chase Claypool, he's going to see a, a, an uptick in, in target share, um, as probably will EQ St. Brown. But once again, they just don't throw the ball a lot, so I'd be pretty careful getting to heavy exposures in the Chicago passing game. Uh, Bears defense, 2,300, probably staying off of this as well, even though I, I really do like the price. Um, you know, they get I – mean, Philly is incredibly strong – and the Bears could get uh, could get run out of the stadium here. So um, that's kind of how I'd like to play the game. Probably my favorite piece is Fields at, at 74. Um, strong point per dollar and value play, of course, but uh, I really like the ownership down here low because we know that he's got 150-yard rushing upside. And he's also got, you know, you could chuck the ball 20 times, throw two touchdown passes as well, you know. So uh, plenty of upside that's not priced in here. Um, certainly in the ownership figure for Fields in Chicago. Uh, okay, moving on, Casey and Houston. Um, Casey laid a huge number, 14 on the road here. We saw how dangerous that can be in the NFL, just in general. You don't usually make money laying two touchdowns or more on the road in the NFL, uh, despite the very clear differences um, and delta in in efficiencies and metrics and all this jazz uh, on paper when they get out there and they play the games this is still the nfl and um dallas didn't show up last week against houston houston really did show up they almost won this game that said kansas city's offense is a, is markedly better than dallas and houston um yeah you know i'd be pretty hard pressed to like even if you'd have to lay me a pretty pretty big number uh for me to take a houston bet in the sense that um you know expecting them to perform as they did last week against two of the top five teams in the league uh you know i'd, I'd need a pretty pretty good price on that so that said um at 14 flat i made it higher i made it 16 uh, i think the number is low and that's really just because Kansas City's offense is markedly better than Dallas. Um, Dallas obviously is better in the in the running game, but Kansas City's passes offense is outrageously efficient. They've got 26 guys. We saw last week it was the Jarek McKinnon show. Um, but they can of course use use Kelsey, right? They've used him like Kelsey's got the most upside of any tight end. Uh, like they obviously use him as a receiver, but they've got MVS, right? Um, they've got Pacheco now in the backfield that they can use. So a bunch of different guys here, Sky Moores, right? Um, that they can that they can really filter the football to. So that's really why I'm I'm a big I'm a big on Kansas City this week. I think they could put up a, a pretty crooked number. But once again, when we're laying huge numbers. Uh, or we're attacking DFS games where teams are laying huge numbers. Uh, we got to be careful with that, especially if we're paying very expensive price tags. Um, now, once again, Mahomes is going to you know pop up there along with Jalen Hurts. Uh, this this number may even be higher than you know in raw projection figures than Hurts was. Like in in any case, they're super close. Um, you know, it, it's fine to play Mahomes, right? We're gonna have Really not a whole ton of super interesting games uh, as far as, like, cheap value. So it might be hard to squeeze in something like a Mahomes-Kelsey. Uh, you might have to make some kind of gulpy decisions, so to speak. Um, but if you can make it happen, I think it, I think it's perfectly viable because 
uh, undoubtedly here there there's a large large mismatch um, in in Kansas City and Houston so um, I like getting the Juju 58 make it a little bit cheaper uh, you could play him as a one-off you could play him in stacks I think that's fine you could play a Pacheco as well once again this is still the best spot in the league targeting Houston's run defense uh, for opposing you know running backs so 5900 price is probably a little aggressive just based on um, how balanced or imbalanced, I, I suppose, the Kansas City offense is toward the pass with respect to the rush. Um, so 59, probably a little aggressive. Same thing with Jarek McKinnon at 5,200 in tournaments. I mean, of course, the upside is there. We saw what they could do, but uh, I think we just have to be careful at these particular price tags. You want to mix them in in stacks, I think that's fine as... Um, you know, lower owned tournament darts. I think it's perfectly playable. Once again, like MVS, uh, I'm going to like the guy pretty much always and um, until I hop off the train and, you know, <laughs> that's that's when he'll finally get there, I suppose. But uh, 3800 is a pretty good price here. And he is going to be, what, the third receiving option in the offense. we got to keep that in mind when we come down here to just a number two wide receiver, but we can't forget about Kelsey up top, right? So, um Chiefs defense is fine at 4,000. You got to pay for it. Just because we're attacking Houston's offense, though, that's really the only reason I think it's fine. Um, you know, you're going to have either Driscoll or Davis Mills, whoever the hell they're going to start over there uh, in Houston. I think it's fine to play the opposing defense uh, in in most scenarios. Certainly, we saw what a few weeks ago with the Browns. Um, those are all the points they scored came from the defense, right? So perfectly fine to get there. Uh, not my favorite play because I do believe that Kansas City does have some vulnerabilities on defense. Um, that's not to say, however, that we can really take advantage of them with Houston's offense because they are dreadful. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on Nico. He should be back this week, but, uh, you know, we'll keep an eye on him. I did see guys like Chris Moore pop a little bit in, in optimal, just at 3,400 or whatever he was last week. Um, you know, optimal pre-slate, of course. Uh, but from Houston's perspective, it's the the usual suspects, right? It's Damian Pierce. You got to keep an eye on him as well. We're kind of getting to December now, where um, like things like Thursday games and just in a, an extended season starting to wear on a lot of guys. So um, attrition is is really kind of playing a part here as we get to the, the latter weeks of the of the NFL season. Um, Brandon Cooks, uh, I'm not super interested in it at, at 4,900. Um, he's been hurt, but, you know, if you land on him, it's probably all right. They're very likely to be trailing, and by very likely, I mean almost certainly uh, in this game. And if he's back and healthy and playing again, same thing with Nico, uh, you can – you could throw these guys in as one-offs. I would stay off stacks. There's just not enough upside here. Same with Jordan Akins. You'd find he's a cheap tight end, but, I mean, we have volume concerns, right? Um, Texas defense, once again, they have to be 1,000 for me to consider him against Kansas City. Okay, kind of a boring game here in Detroit in the Jets. Um, I think the Jets are going to win this game. They It's pick in the markets right now, I believe. Um, and their pick, you know, it floats between pick and Jets one or even Detroit one, you know. So um, this is going to be a close game in by most accounts here. We might have some Mike White questions on the other side. We'll get to that in a sec. Uh, I don't think it's a very good spot at all for Detroit. I know Detroit's been very good recently, uh, but they haven't played any very, very good defenses, right, that could stop their offense. That's really not the case here with the Jets' defense. Um, let's not forget that Goff really only has, let's call it one and a half options in the receiving game here. Um, with DJ Chark, don't really use Josh Reynolds a lot. They've got Jamison Williams now who caught a touchdown pass last week, but we, they're still lacking a little bit of, uh, flexibility in the passing game overall. Right. And it's always Amon Ross St. Brown who got there again last week. 7,800, I think he's perfectly fine. I don't like this spot for him. I think the ownership is too high up against the Jets' defense here. 
Um, this is absolutely the best unit on the field. Once again, as it was last week in Buffalo, um, metrics-wise. And targeting Detroit's sort of holes and a little bit of inefficiency um, or inefficient spread, so to speak, in, in number of athletes and, and weapons on the offensive side, uh, I think is pretty warranted. And I, I kind of like the Jets in this spot. I think they could be able to score, um, presuming that it is Mike White and, and not the, the statue and corpse of Joe Flacco or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so we got to just kind of feel things out over the next several days and, and see how they develop. But um, DFS-wise, I'm really not super enthused about getting to any of these guys. Uh, in the running back room, we did see both running backs kind of disappoint last week. Um, and as a matter of fact, I came off, uh, DeAndre Swift pretty significantly compared to my earlier week takes the ownership steam just too high. And I thought, uh, for example, that a pivot up to Miles Sanders is a markedly better play. Um, same sort of deal. Like these guys are just going to be splitting carries and splitting work here. And it's really hard to peg which one's going to get, you know, the, the touchdown equity, um, Obviously, DeAndre Swift has a more passing game equity. So in super close games and tight games, high pace games, that's probably who we'd want to attack. Um, but in pure rushing metrics, this is a terrible spot up against the run defense of the Jets. So I don't really want to go after any of these guys. As I said, just have volume concerns for the tertiary and quaternary pieces in the, in the passing game. So it would be Amon Ra, but I think he's the ownership's too high at, at this moment. Uh, given this price tag in this spot. So I'm mostly off of the, the Lions this week, um, including their defense. If, like, I really don't want to play the Lions defense, certainly not a 3,000 in general. But if we get a backup Flacco or, or whatever the hell it is um, on the other side, then, you know, we'll, uh, it could be something that you could land on. You know, it wouldn't be the worst play in the world, but, it, I mean, it's uh, not something I'm I'm super enthused about. Uh, so here we do have Mike White. Like I said, we do have to keep an eye out for, for what's going on. Uh, Garrett Wilson, I really do like it at 6000 I think he's underpriced still. Um, of course, not a hell of a lot of upside in general for the Jets' offense, but this is a good spot against the Detroit defense, and they could put up some points here. Uh, once again, Mike White won tournaments for what two weeks in a row at a cheap price tag so at, at 5400 i think you can get to him if he plays with garrett wilson once again um you got to keep an eye out for Corey davis he could be a piece we could mix in also same thing with tyler conklin we're once again just getting into volume concerns with these guys 3200 for the jets defense i think is all right here as a matter of fact i think we're going to see some regression uh and detroit sort of come back to earth a little bit um i think they've been quite overperforming the last month and a half or so. They won like five or six or six or seven or something like that. I don't think they're that quite that good. So, you know, I don't think that getting to, I you know, instead of a cheaper 3,000 Detroit defense on the other side, I think I'd rather just play the Jets. You know, they're, they're a better unit. And, um, you know, the NFL is a game of momentum. So we want to buy low and sell high. And I think this is starting to get to, the point where we could consider selling high on, on the Detroit uh, offense a little bit. Uh, and that means in, in you know, a lot of situations fading them by playing the defense on the other side. So um, Jets offense, still some, some health concerns um, in the running game. Yeah, sure. You want to get to Bam Knight. I think that's fine. 5,300. think he's playable. Got to be aware of the Michael Carter sort of spelling as well. Um, and they'll, they'll be balanced here, most likely. So something to be aware of in that regard. Probably not my favorite tournament plays would have uh, some upside concerns, but I think they're they're worth leaving in your in your player pools. Uh, okay, Dallas Jacksonville. Um, once again, I, like I think Dallas. Uh, they just didn't get off the bus last week. Um, I don't think anybody in the league, uh, in the industry, would. You know, if we're talking about Dallas and and playing Houston every single week, they would 
say, well, yeah, Houston would probably keep it within three points and Dallas would need a, a game-winning drive as time expires every single time when they play Houston, right? That's not the case. So that said, that's just to illustrate that teams are not nearly as good nor as bad as they look in any one week. And I think Dallas looked pretty bad. So um, same thing with Jacksonville on the other side. I think they looked pretty damn good last week against Tennessee. I don't think they're near that good. I think they're sneaky all right, but uh, you know they're they're not putting up 40 points against um, against Dallas good, right? So uh, I think we're going to see some regression hit Jacksonville as well, and this is kind of a momentum play also in that Dallas only laying four and a half, and I think that number is a little low. I made it higher. Um, I think it's a pretty good spot for Dallas now. Their strength, of course, is in the rushing game. It's not so much in the passing game. So it's a little curious that we are seeing Dak pop uh, so hard. But once again, it's mostly just a lack of options in the 6K range in the quarterback room. So if you want to play Dak, of course, go ahead. Play him with CD. It's fine. 7,300, I think it's fine. I don't think there's a whole hell of a lot of actual value to be squeezed out of this price. But Jacksonville is attackable through the air for sure. And... You know, there, there's upside that that CD could realize, uh, and he could blast through this 7,300 price tag, really no problem. Um, I'd kind of balk a little bit at the 14% ownership. I'm not totally sure that CD should be in one of every seven teams uh, on the weekend here. So that, that seems a little bit high. Um, so that would you know, be a cause for concern for me. And, and once again, Dallas is super, super rush heavy they're very efficient in the rushing game with Pollard and Zeke both healthy now um at 7100 on Tony Pollard I, this is probably where he should have been priced all damn season right and at 62 I think Zeke's probably a little bit overpriced you know given the the timeshare here um but that doesn't mean that, that we can fade really either one of these guys. I would have upside concerns for Zeke in particular not necessarily for Pollard they'll they'll give him passing work out of the backfield as well um if they need to use it i think that's where the offense in dallas would most likely try and default is to the running backs and use them very efficiently to march football down the field right um so i think my favorite passing piece here if i if i were playing dak would be actually michael gallup at 4500 uh i like saving 2800 off of cd lamb here um getting a third of the ownership probably i mean almost definitely don't have the same sort of upside right so you might have to force some of these teams in but i like some michael gallup here i think this is an exploitable spot against jacksonville's uh past even kind of average past defense um 3700 for the cowboys defense i think they're probably a bit aggressive here but once again uh, i do like dallas in this spot and i think you could play them I'd be worried about ownership as well. But just keep in mind, you know, a noisy standard deviation so far. So we got to let these numbers flesh out uh, toward the end of the weekend. It'll drop um, this number, 11%. So I'm, I'm still fine playing them. And, and this may very well be a week where we have to spend up on defense. But uh, not my favorite play by any means. Uh, Dalton Schultz, still not super interested at this price tag. Just doesn't get enough work in the offense. Um Noah Brown, again, uh, he's a pretty distant third piece, and Dallas just doesn't throw the ball uh, near enough to, to warrant uh, attacking a third wide receiver piece here. So um, that's pretty much how I'd like to attack it. Probably mostly just the running back. Some Dak, Michael Gallup, certainly some CD. You can mix him in, but uh, not one of my favorite sacks of the week's week by any means. Jacksonville on the other side, really not stoked about Trev here at 6,000. I think... Um, Dallas's defense is very, very strong, both in the passing game and the run game. So that kind of takes me off Travis Etienne a little bit as well. Um, I'm really waiting for Peterson. Just give this damn kid to football. Like, give him 25. Give him, give him the Saquon Bar Barkley treatment. Give him 25 carries and six targets out of the backfield every single week. Um, so at 6,000, I think, you know, for his role or what should be his role in the offense... Uh, I think he's underpriced. He should be up at the 68, 6900 range most often. Uh, and at 10% ownership, I think this is all right. He's a, he's a fine tournament piece. He definitely has the upside to get there, especially if Jacksonville is trailing, like I expect them to be. And um, 
they may have difficulty running the football here. So they could have to use him in a passing game and on PPR sites like DK individually, um, or specifically DK and Yahoo, right? We can probably use some some PPR value from Travis Etienne. Uh, Christian Kirk, 6,600. Not sure I want to get crazy with Jacksonville's pass offense here, uh, but I think this is a it's an okay tournament play as well. If you are stacking Trev, once again, I think he's probably overpriced in general. Um, Zay Jones, though, at 4,900, we saw last week, he's still getting the work. It, it's consistent for him, and he's still kind of underpriced. Uh, I think we'll probably see, you know, if we see a, a solid target share this week, from Zay once again, and of course a, per, a decent performance, we'll probably finally see him pop through the $5,000 price tag. Uh, he did pop to 4900 and then dudded with like a three-point outing or something a couple of weeks ago. So, um, you know, Price is trying to to pop through some maybe 5K little resistance level here. So uh, I think that's a, a good tournament play as well at 4900 uh, Evan Ingram, he he went crazy, 3,800. Like finally, I've been waiting for this since his early days with the with the Giants. Um, once again, don't like chasing that kind of stuff necessarily, but he's a 3,800 and he's you know unpopular as of right now. I think it, it's a fine tight end piece that you can mix into the room. Once again, we're kind of starving for some tight end value. Um, still staying off Marvin Jones, uh, it's just not doing it. And Jags defense 2,400. Uh, probably don't want to be playing this type of game, given how I think the uh, this outing for the Jags is likely to play out. Uh, I do like Dallas quite a bit in this spot uh, to at least cover the four and a half or whatever it is in the market. So not super excited, even at a cheap price tag, twenty four hundred. But they're twenty four hundred. Uh, it, it's fine. Um, really, where I would have most concern is because Dallas is is generally uh, leaning on the rush game, there's just fewer opportunities for Dak to make mistakes, right? So, um, mostly probably just singleton pieces here from from the Jags and like runbacks, um, but really not a hell of a lot of stack exposure necessarily. I'd, I really like mostly one offs from this game. Uh, okay, Atlanta and New Orleans. Um, I'm kind of yapping here once again, so hopefully you're watching me on whatever one and a half x speed here. Uh, it's going to be Desmond Ritter. Looks like Mariota, I don't know, busted his knee up or something, and he'll be out. It's probably going on IR, but uh, I love this kid, man. Uh, watched him a good bit when he was in college at Cincinnati with uh, our good friend Alec Pierce over in Indianapolis right now. Uh, this is a good combination. He's got a lot of upside in the passing game. He's efficient, and he's a big, big body. He can move, and he can run. So I think this is a significant upgrade offensively for Atlanta. Really what we're going to have to just keep an eye on is this offense only wants to run the damn football. Um, that said, Drake London here at 4,700, super efficient in short yardage and in the red zone. Um, I, I still really like this at 47, and I'll probably have a, a, a good bit of him. I think this is like he's the number one receiver. You just very rarely get that. Uh, at this kind of price tag. We, we saw it with Garrett Wilson a few weeks ago. Um, when guys get down here, you just kind of have to buy and, and hope that offenses that have, to this point, disappointed, just kind of pop a little bit. And I think this could serve for Atlanta as a little bit of a spark plug. Um, once again, he, he's just more balanced. He's a better runner. And I think he's a better passer in general than Marcus Mariota. Uh Problem is he's he's a rookie, obviously, right? So we got to be careful with that. Um, Corderell, you could you could consider once again they're they're super pass or super rush heavy. Uh, New Orleans is just not very good, um, top to bottom. They blew that game against Tampa uh, in a pretty bad way. So if you want to get to some pieces here, uh, I like some Ritter. You can punt him in in deeper tournament teams. Wouldn't go crazy with the ownership just because we don't know what they're going to want to do with them. But if they let him loose, he's got upside to blast through this 15 points here uh, pretty significantly. Uh, if he popped for 30 this week, I would not be shocked at all. Uh, he's very explosive. So if we are playing him, I'd like to get to Drake London, probably stay off Ollie Zacchaeus. Um, and Cordero Patterson, once again, it's, it's just kind of the, 
the usual suspects from the offense here. 5,900 and low ownership again. I love playing Corderell like this, and I think he has upside to pop through this number pretty good. Uh, this seems like a quite a low number at, at just 11 here. Um, if this continues to flesh out toward the weekend and uh, just like sort of hover here, these point per dollar and value metrics are really going to prevent you from just scripting and getting a lot of Corderell. So if you do like him against New Orleans, um, he's not my favorite necessarily running back of the week, but uh, I think it's he's perfectly playable. Uh, you, you may have to force in some of those quarter row Patterson teams. Um, staying off Algier, because most of the work is going to come to quarter row. Falcons defense, 2,500. It's, it's within consideration. Um, they're not all that great, right? They have a significant weakness through the air. Um, so that would that would worry me. But price is good, and they're going to be fine, because New Orleans is probably going to try and throw the football a little bit and get a little bit aggressive, I would assume. Um, not touching anybody else, of course, from the Atlanta offense. On the other side, do like some New Orleans. They're laying a big, kind of a big number here, uh, four and a half and five, or whatever it is in the markets. Uh, it's sitting four, four and a half, uh, in most spots right now. I think that's a little aggressive, to be quite honest. I don't think this team's very good. Um, and I think, as I said, Atlanta's going to be bringing a little bit of a spark here. So that said, this could be a pretty close game. Um, what we are seeing total-wise is about 43, so not expected to see a lot of pace, and that's naturally driven by uh, how rush-heavy Atlanta is. Um, but I think we can get to some pieces of New Orleans over here, certainly in the passing game. If you want to play some Dalton at 52, I think that's all right as well. Um, popping certainly better than Ritter on the other side at the same price tag. You can play Olave, of course. He's always going to see ownership, 6,500. Not sure if there's a ton of actual value left to squeeze out at this price, given how kind of low upside the New Orleans offense is in general. But at 11% ownership, I think this is fine. No Landry for me at 38. Um, and once again, you just can't play Taysom Hill. Really wish they'd switch him to like running back or, or something. So you could actually consider him as a flex play because they do use him in the offense. Uh, he, he's just super tilting when he vultures stuff from guys that we do play like Alvin Kamara. Um, now this week, Mark Ingram, I think he tore his MCL um, and he's going to, he's out, right? So it'll probably be Dwayne Washington that backs up Alvin Kamara. And that means that Kamara at 68 could very well hear, uh, put up a, a pretty decent score, especially if Atlanta can keep this game close. Um, and once again, they are laying, what did I say, four in a 43 and a half. So, um, oh, I'm kind of frozen here a little bit. There we go. So, you know, the dog over here could put up 20 points. And, you know, if New Orleans does cover this number, you know, they're going to have to score, and really they've only got two guys that they, they can get the ball to, and that's Olave and that's Alvin Kamara, right? So um, would expect a, a decent uptick in volume, even though Alvin Kamara has disappointed quite regularly this season. Uh, I think this is a fine play to get to. Not super crazy about the price tag, but in general we know that Kamara can pop for 40 um, if they just give him the damn ball. So that's how I'd like to play this game. Like Atlanta, short, skinny stacks on the other side, and – Probably prefer one-off runbacks with Olave and Kamara as opposed to stacks, but you can certainly stack a Dalton Olave with a Kamara, run it back with a Drake London, or run it back with a Cordero Patterson or something like that. Um, those are viable constructions in deeper tournament builds. Okay, uh, once again, we have questions in quarterback room. Could be Mitch Trubisky, could be Kenny Pickett. Uh, we're still not totally sure Pickett was concussed. Um... I'm not sure how serious it was. So uh, whether that means, I mean, concussions are obviously serious, right? But whether that means he's going to be out or not, or like, who knows? So if it's Trubisky, well, let's let's back up. If it's Pickett, um, I kind of like Pittsburgh a little bit here to take advantage of the Carolina of, um, Carolina sort of weaknesses and deficient. They're just, they just don't have a lot of upside defensively, and they can give up some points. Uh, despite the fact that they controlled Seattle, uh, pretty much from the outset last week. So um, if it's Pickett, I, I do still like getting to this offense a little bit. They're close. They're about to figure it out. I think I'd rather, um, yeah, 
even if Pickett plays, I think might or doesn't play, whether you know, whatever it is, if it's Trubisky, um, I'm less on the passing game. But if it's Pickett, like great. Uh, I, I could consider some more Deontay, Fryer, Muth, or George Pickens pieces in that event. If not, I, th- I still think my favorite piece from from the, the game, no matter what happens in the quarterback room, would be Najee. 5,700, I like this a lot. Uh, I think this is a pretty good spot. Carolina is very attackable on the ground, and unfortunately, we just didn't get Kenneth Walker last week. I thought it was a killer spot there um, for Seattle. So I think Najee here could get see a, a really aggressive uptick in volume, certainly if it's Trubisky that goes. Less so if, if it's Pickett, but uh, I, I like this either way. I think you can mix him into stacks. I think you can play him as a one-off. Um, and I think some pieces here from the Pittsburgh offense are playable. Uh, I'm probably not super crazy about playing full-on stacks uh, because, once again, this total in, in Pittsburgh games is just – perpetually low this one's sitting at 37 and a half right now with Carolina laying two and a half so by most accounts it's going to probably be Trubisky um, because I think that number would be a little bit tighter in the event it was Pickett uh, with a full healthy offense against whatever Sam Darnold over here in in Carolina so um, prefer once again mostly one-off pieces here don't want to get crazy and overexpose ourselves to a very low total game kind of boring overall but playable pieces at these price tags uh nevertheless Steelers defense I like at 3100 once again some noisy ownership figures coming in early week Uh, I think this is a an interesting piece to get to kind of in the mid 3k range um or mid range at 3k for a defense uh on the other side like who knows what they're they're going to do with DJ Moore, Deontay Foreman. Deontay Foreman got kind of, like, totally shuttled out of the offense last week. Um, he's been dealing with a couple of injuries. Like, he claimed that he was fully healthy, that his foot was good. Uh, he also had, like, a rib issue or something. So um, they gave a lot of work to Raheem Blackshear and... Somebody else. I don't even think it was Chuba, to be honest. Chuba did vulture a touchdown early in the game. So um, if it is Chuba that leads the backfield and Deontay Foreman's out or something this week, then I I once again like this play at a cheap price tag um, in general, right, in in a vacuum. In this particular spot against Pittsburgh run defense, I don't. So really no matter what, if it's Foreman, if it's Hubbard, if it's Raheem Blackshear, uh, I'm probably staying off of the running game from the Panthers. Uh, pass game, once again, like we've been waiting all freaking season for DJ Moore to just go crazy. And the problem is he's got Sam Darnold throwing him the football. Um, there's just not a lot of upside from the Panthers in general, even though they've got a couple of pieces now, DJ Moore, Terrace Marshall. Um, Visca at 34, he's once again just a super deep tournament dart that you could consider. You'd have to force him in. Uh, 34 is probably too expensive, to be quite honest. Probably should be the, the stone men, given the volume. But one of these deeper pieces that you could consider for sure. Uh, staying off the tight end room, I mean, this offense is just pretty pitiful. And once again, there's a, a total of 37.5 in this game. Not much I want to target from the Panthers. Uh, I like the Pittsburgh side. Let's see. Panthers, like I said, they're catching or laying 2.5. Pittsburgh catching the 2.5. Um, on the other side, I'd prefer just to get to them. I think their offense is better, even with Trubitsky, and I think their defense is better. So um, two and a half points seems a little bit aggressive. And if you're in the uh, your really thin value game um, in a tight total, I don't think uh, playing some Pittsburgh in, the, in a betting market is all that bad. Um but nothing here for the most part from DFS. New England and Vegas getting to the afternoon games. Uh, let's see how long we are. Er, been kind of yapping here. See if we can blast through this in the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, New England tore apart Arizona pretty good, but naturally uh, Kyler went out and it was just kind of over from there. Um, not that Arizona is competitive at all anyway. Mac Jones, I think, is, is a fine play here. Vegas their defense, we can attack, right? They're they're awful in the passing game. I think there's hidden sort of sneaky value that we could get to with maybe a Jacoby or a Devontae um, 
at some cheap price tags. Once again, you're getting a number one receiver under 5,000. It's just it's just pretty rare. We've only seen it a handful of times this season. Um, Devontae at 37. I think this is a playable piece as well. Probably stay off the Nelson Aguilar. Just a he's really always been just kind of a possession receiver. Not a whole lot of upside there. Hunter Henry, same sort of deal. Not a lot of volume for the tight ends uh, in the Patriots offense. Um, got to be aware of what is going to happen with Ramondre. He's probably going to be fine. Uh, early week suggestions are that he will be at 7,000, kind of aggressive. Um, but I think it's, it's an okay, really, it's not like super contrarian. Should he be in one of every nine teams? Um, at at 7,000, I don't know. I mean, it seems a little high to me. But uh, I think he's he's playable for sure because New England does just want to run the football. And Ramondre is, like, incredibly explosive. So uh, he's got a lot of upside, some that isn't necessarily priced in at this tag in this particular matchup. Uh, in a vacuum, I think he's probably about where he should be. Same thing with the ownership, probably about where it should be. So um, not a whole lot of super exploitable value, but definitely somebody we are kind of lacking – some very high upside plays in the running back room this week as well with only 10 games on the, on the docket here. So I think this getting to Ramondre uh, is also very playable. Uh, like I said, you could play Jacoby, you could play Devante. Um, I like playing some contrarian stacks here with a little bit of Mac Jones, very cheap. And then you can just not worry about the ownership, right. And, and go eat to Devante or the uh, new Hopkins kind of stuff. Uh, you can play the CD lambs. Um, you can play, Whoever the hell you want, you can play Travis Kelsey, right? When you when you've got a cheaper offensive stack here, so I think this is a viable tournament construction, a vi- viable tournament build that you can consider. Um, on the other side, always, always, always like Devontae Adams. Once again at nine thousand, think he's perfectly fine. Play him every week, doesn't matter. Um, really, the only problem you'll run into once again is construction. Spot is fine as long as they throw him the ball, he can beat everybody. Uh, Derek Carr, 56. If you want to play that stack, I think, think it's fine, right? We've seen that Carr has 25-point upside pretty regularly if he gives the ball to Devontae. Um, he's also got a little bit of upside here with Matt Collins. We've got to be wary of, of what's going on with Josh Jacobs and his finger. He looked like he was in a lot of pain, and he could very well just have, like, a broken finger. He, he might need surgery. I mean, who knows? Uh, they taped it up, and he... And he went and he continued uh but he he was shaking that thing um pretty significantly and regularly uh on the sidelines after plays um all that kind of jazz so that would you know affect him in the passing game not so much in the run game right but um you know it's just something we have to kind of keep in mind and, and monitor as we move through the week Mac Hollins, 4,600, another deeper tournament dart that you could consider. Once again, I think there could be some points in this game. And we are sitting at about 44.5, kind of middling total right now. Um, it's pick or anywhere from Raiders 1 to, to New England 1 in the markets right now. So by all accounts, so far, it uh, should be a close game. And I think there could be some sneaky points or some exploitable spots here for both teams. Um New England's defense pretty good, keeps him in a lot of games, so that would kind of take me off of the Josh Jacobs a little bit. I think he's priced where he probably should be, and the ownership coming in usually where it should be for his role in the offense. Um, but that said, I have concerns about Vegas's defense, so I think New England could put some up here. Um, and in that event, Vegas is going to need to compete, right? So they're going to need to throw the football, and that that puts Devontae Adams and Derek Carr and even a little bit of Matt Collins in play. Not super enthused about the Foster Moreau, 3,500. He's whatever. Um, He has upside at the price, but the upside to win a tournament, uh, it's probably lacking a little bit. 3,500 for the Raiders' defense, I think, is a total non-starter. I think they're way too expensive. No, thank you. Okay, Arizona and Denver could probably get through this pretty quickly. Once again, it is Colt McCoy and... Uh, and not Kyler, so these numbers are going to change. Um, one kind of interesting point I want to make here is Denver's defense is most attackable on the ground. It's not to say they're a bad unit, but we've seen high-powered uh, rushing and dynamic offenses, like specifically the Raiders, who we just talked about, uh, really 
sort of take it to Denver with the running backs. Um, Arizona is not that offense, and they haven't shown that they could run the football all year. They got one of the worst uh, rushing efficiency units in the league. And at 6,900 for James Conner, you know, even though we get a, a backup quarterback here, um, this offense is bad, man. They cannot move the football, and they get a really, really good unit on the road in Denver over here. I know Denver gave up a lot of points last week. That was the Chiefs, okay? So a um, little different story here between Arizona and, and Kansas City. So that said, I think value-wise for James Conner, I think he is overpriced, and I think his ownership number is way too high uh, at this price tag for his role in the offense, even though the most attackable or the most efficient way you attack Denver, if you do, is either with the Chiefs, right, like B Kansas City, or uh, with the running backs. Um, I just think he's overpriced. So I would probably stay off of this and actually rather pivot to the other side if I had to choose between the two. Um, who I do like is New Hopkins, 7,700. Like, he's still a target monster. He's going to get Pat Sertan here in pretty much every scenario, I think. Um, but we saw, like, guys like Devontae Adams, right, Uh what, what they can do to guys like Pat Sertan. Uh, I think Sertan's going to be a very, very good corner in the league for a very long time, but let's not forget that he's a rookie, and DeAndre Hopkins has been one of the best possession receivers in the NFL um, you know, for several years now, right? So Nuke can absolutely win this matchup, and with Colt McCoy, yeah, I, I think I mentioned at the outset, he came in after Kyler got hurt, and he still threw the ball 40 times. You know what I mean? So they're going to they're gonna throw the ball. And Colt McCoy is capable. He's a capable quarterback, and he, he's not just a, a total fish in the backfield, right, under center. So um, that said, I think they're going to try and, and move the ball here a little bit. They're probably not going to be very successful overall, so I don't want to stack him. Uh, with Nuke necessarily, don't want to play Hollywood, don't want to play Rondell Moore, any of his Dorch nonsense, whatever it is. I don't want to get to the passing game outside of Nuke uh, in most instances. So I'm mostly off of, of Arizona. That said, the number in the betting markets is Denver laying 2.5 with a total of 36. So you don't really want a lot of exposure to this game in general um, in a super low total game. But like you really want to lay three points with the with the Broncos? I mean, I don't know about that. Like, we got questions with Russ Wilson. We don't know if he's going to play. If that's the case, it's going to be Brett Rippon. Now you want to play backup quarterback with a bad offense to begin with? I mean, no, thank you, right? Like, how do you like you want to lay points with that? I don't know. That seems kind of crazy. So that said, Arizona would be required to score in the event that they're able to cover a number on the road against Denver, right? So, um. You could consider one or more piece from the Arizona offense, just not my favorite, to get to a uh, a James Conner or a Marquise Brown or anything. I'd just rather hope it, it's Nuke that gets 14 targets, catches 10 balls and, and two touchdowns or whatever, and then you just you, you know ride into the sunset. So um, that said, I did mention that Conner, I, I think, is a, I don't want to say a poor play, uh, but kind of poor. Uh, I'd rather play Latavius Murray if I had to choose between the two on the other side. At 5,100, um, he's actually projecting relatively well here. Now, once again, this is a bad offense. With a backup quarterback, I have upside concerns for Lat Murray. They just don't give him the football enough. He needs 20, 25 carries because he's not super efficient, and Denver's offensive line really isn't very good. So at 12%, I think the ownership is probably once again too high. Not sure he should be in one in every eight teams. Um, probably a little bit aggressive. But once again, like Denver doesn't have a whole lot of spots here that they can just give the football. So we could see an uptick in volume this week in that regard. If it is Brett Rippon. If it is Russ, uh, sure, maybe they unlock something. I doubt it. But you can definitely attack Arizona. We saw what a pretty mediocre offense in New England did to them as well. So you could you could get to some Russ Wilson. Obviously, I would not chase the Judy at 6,100. Um, we'll have to keep an eye on Cortland Sutton. If he plays, I'd much prefer him. I like this as a one-off if he's healthy. Uh, favorite play, though, is, is once again just going to be Greg Dulcich. Uh, I think he's underpriced still. 
for the work or the volume that he's getting. He needs to convert some of these targets to make us not look like an idiot, but uh, it's okay. Do I want to stack any of the Denver offense? Um, only in the event that Russ plays. If Brett Rippon is in there, like, no, thank you. I'd rather just pivot to Desmond Ritter, 200 more expensive, uh, for who I think is a far better quarterback. Uh, Broncos defense going to steam. 2700 for them. Uh, I think it's all right. They're, they're a good unit and getting, once again, a, a pretty mediocre offense on the other side. I think it's perfectly fine. They're probably your cash defense this week, um, but you could play them in tournaments as well, presuming that their ownership just doesn't steam super hard. All right, let's try and uh, finish this up quickly. Tennessee and the Chargers. I think there could be some really sneaky points here. Um, I've mentioned that the, the NFL is a game of momentum, and Tennessee is, is going the wrong way. Uh, these two teams are going in, in opposite directions, really, right? Chargers performed very well uh, against Miami. I didn't think Miami was all that good. So I think the Chargers looked a little bit better than they really are. Uh, and Tennessee looked just markedly worse than I think they are. Uh, they had also been really kind of on a roll, won like five or six, six or seven or whatever. And then they got kind of slapped in the face a little bit by some teams that they could beat. Um, that said... How do we want to attack this week? Well, we got to keep an eye on Traylon Burks, see if he's going to play. Um, if he plays, I think we can actually play some Ryan Tannehill, Traylon Burks, and some Derrick Henry. I think this is the best spot of the week, Derrick Henry against the Chargers defense. Um, so I think he's a stone lock. This ownership is probably going to push 30% by the by the weekend, uh, and, and I think it should be. I'll probably still come in well over the field, um, at that number, I, it's not that he's underpriced or anything. I did, this is just the best spot of the week, uh, maybe outside of like an Isaiah Pacheco against Houston or something, you know. Um, but given Derrick Henry's total upside, I mean, we saw that they were just feeding him the football in the first quarter last week. Like if if that game strip didn't markedly switch in a hurry, then Derrick Henry is probably winning tournaments last week. Um, so that said, just got to keep an eye on Traylon here. Uh, if if he plays, I think it's viable to get to the passing game because I think Chargers are going to be able to score. They're very potent offense through the air, and Tennessee's weakness is absolutely in the passing passing game. So um, I like Derrick Henry the most, of course, but I think at 5,300 you can you can play Tannehill. I'm less enthused if Traylon is out to be playing Tanny because then I think the best option you run into uh, we don't even have him over here, but it's Chiga Conquo. Um, We'll have an, an ownership and and projection for him. He's at 3,100. Um, I think that's a pretty okay play, an okay tight end play to mix into your pool. Less enthused about the Austin Hooper because, you know, we're assuming that in this, you know, sort of scenario that Traylon is out, uh, which would suggest that Chigakonkwo, that they would like, would get more target share and, and, wide receiver work less than um, his tight end work, right? They'd probably prefer to use Austin Hooper more as a blocking tight end and just throw the football to Chig. Um, but in the event that Traylon is in, uh, I think you can actually play a three-man Tennessee stack. I would not fade Derrick Henry pretty much in any circumstance unless I had 100%. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, really, really, really like DH. Um, I think Tennessee bounces pretty hard for their performance last week against the Jags. Uh, and this is a really, really good spot for them. Uh, what am I doing? Chargers on the other side. This team loves to throw the football, man. And you can absolutely play Justin Herbert with really any of his three pass ca main pass catchers here. These are all pretty good plays. Um, I would say that Palmer, I'm not super stoked about a 5,600 price tag for a number three receiver now because I think the – the volume is starting to flatten out to where it should be and, and kind of normalize, right? We've seen Keenan Allen healthy for several weeks now. And uh, at 6,800, he's still just flat underpriced. Um, so I think this is a really, really good play as well, getting to going back to Keenan Allen in an excellent spot against Tennessee pass defense. Mike Williams, you could play as well. I think he's probably overpriced. Um, but he has a lot of touchdown equity. He's a big, big body man, and he can catch five balls for 85 yards and a score or even two, and that can get you there at 6,300. It's not, it's not bad. Um, 
Gerald Everett, I would probably stay off. Now that they've got a full, healthy wide receiver core at 4,300, not my favorite. He'll be the fourth receiving, uh, maybe even the fifth, if we consider Eckler here, uh, receiving option in the offense. So um, Eckler, you can play every single week as well. 8,500, I think it's it's fine. 11%. I, I do like the ownership figure here um, because most of Eckler's work is going to come in the kind of dump off receiving uh, capacity. Tennessee's run defense is pretty good. So it's not a super exploitable fundamental spot for Eckler in that regard. Um, but you can still play him. Certainly if you're playing the Chargers offense, uh, get pieces of Eckler. And he's, you know, at, at 8,500 in the late games, you can play him in the flex and, even though it's not the best fundamental spot, you can swap off of that depending on how your your early builds sort of shake out, right? So it um, gives you a lot of flexibility here with Eckler. You can play him, of course, um, but if you don't want to play him or you, or you need something um, with perhaps a little bit more upside from a fundamental perspective and a matchup perspective, then you can swap off of him because he's the most expensive guy in the day. Um, like I said, Keenan Allen, I think this is a as close to a lock for a receiver as you're going to get. Uh, target share is just way too high, and he looks really, really good, really, really healthy. We've seen what this offense can do with all of the pieces clicking. Uh, Chargers defense, no thank you at uh, at 2,900. I think Tennessee is probably going to be able to score a little bit here. Um, but really would like to see Traylon Burks back to, to give me a, a hell of a lot of confidence. If he's not back, I think you could almost come off of – Charger stacks. Uh, you're going to need Tennessee to score a little bit. Um, now, what you could do is just run a, a Herbert, Keenan Allen, run it back with De Derrick Henry. Starting to get expensive, you know, but that's a, definitely a viable build. Okay, last game of the day. Um, man, we're just over an hour here. See if I can get through this quickly. Joe Burrow here for the Bengals um, with probably a depleted offensive receiving core, or maybe a depleted receiving core. Who knows? Uh, with T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd, Tyler Boyd dislocated a finger. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not touching this. I, I don't go near hand injuries with wide receivers, um, especially swat, slot wide receivers that are usually forced to uh, catch the ball in short yardage. Uh, they got to use the hands in in those events, right? In those scenarios. And if he's got a busted finger, I like I'm I'm just out. Love the price tag, but uh, no thank you. Same thing with T. Higgins, but he is a deeper field receiver, uh, and he's got a hamstring. So it's the same type of dynamic there. Um, that can kind of linger a little bit. It seems a little less serious than Tyler Boyd's dislocated finger. Um, but nevertheless, hamstring injury is hamstring in injury, and this guy's a wide receiver. So he could very easily tweak something. you got to be very careful with this. Uh, at 7900 I think he's probably a little bit too expensive still. Um I'd like to see him 67, give or take. Uh, you know, I'd, 200 bucks, 200 bucks, but 200 bucks is 200 bucks, right? It's not, not nothing. Um, with Jamar Chase back, um, I think he, like he's just far and away the alpha in this offense. Uh, even with Mixon back healthy last week, they split carries, Mixon and Shamaje Pirine, and Pirine actually got more work out of the passing game or in the passing game than Mixon did last week. So they could be just like mixing so to speak, him back into the offense, Joe. But at 7,200, like, this is a dynamic we have to be aware of. Um, you could play him, certainly, if either one or both of these guys are out. Uh, I, that, that probably makes Mixon just a smash play. But it's something to, you know, just be aware of at, uh, with Samaj P. Ryan here. He earned a lot of opportunities when Mixon was out. He performed very, very well. So uh, something to uh, keep in mind. So that kind of takes me off of full-on Bengal stacks here. I almost like Tampa, even though they can't score and they suck. Uh, I almost like them to cover three and a half or whatever the number is in this game. Um, also kind of a low total, but it's middling, right? 44 sitting right now. Um, I think Tampa could potentially exploit some of the Cincinnati defense over here uh, in some scenarios. Uh, Tampa's been really, really, really bad, and... Um, I think we're just, I'm kind of waiting for a little bit of regression. Could be wrong, uh, because I, I do think Cincinnati is still a markedly better unit uh, overall, or markedly better team, but 
I think they we could be playing some uh, some momentum here as well and and sort of rubber band back to Tampa, catching three and a half at home. Um, that said, who do we want to play in that event? I like Godwin. I think he's all right here at 6,700. Probably a little stiff in the price tag, but it's fine. Mike Evans here at 62. Now we're now we're talking. This guy hasn't shown any upside this week or this season. I think you could probably get to him. I think he's a really good tournament play. Very low ownership, depressed price tag, uh, and he's been bad. Um, you always got to worry about drops with Evans, but he's still a huge body, and Tom Brady still looks to him when they can get down into the red zone. Uh, in the running back room, very hard to have any any degrees of confidence here. 54, 5,500 for the... Um, the two lead backs, Rashad White and, and Fournette. Cincinnati most attackable, probably on the ground. But, you know, th like this is the most pass-heavy offense in the NFL with Brady back here still. So at 5,500, think he is deep tournament viable. Uh, you could play him with Godwin, you could play him with Evans. Um, you could you could throw deep tournament darts at Julio Jones at 3,900. I think this is fine. They use him in a downfield capacity. Give him three, four targets a game, whatever it is, but they're downfield. So he can pop even though he's uh, old and washed. Um, the tight ends have touchdown equity, but that's pretty much it. So I think Tampa is is within consideration here to be some of these really kind of ignored pieces in the latter part of the slate that you could swap into or have uh, that nobody else has that, that really kind of push you up the leaderboard. So um, that said, I think that's pretty much it. We'll uh, go back to the default screen here eh, maybe not um and i guess just talk about quickly recap stacks um i think philly's fine prefer probably just one-offs mostly up here like fields a lot uh kansas city you can certainly play don't really want anything from houston don't think you if you're stacking kansas city you even need to run it back with houston uh i think houston's probably going to cover this number this week um not super jacked about stacks here either if anything it would be the jets and then a, a run back um but not very excited about that uh because i think that not going to be a lot of points scored here so um not my favorite game to target dallas is fine jacksonville run backs are fine as well uh, just be careful that Dallas wants to run the football. So probably my favorite pieces there would be the running backs as opposed to the passing game uh, with some elevated ownership. I do like Atlanta and the New Orleans game here. Um, I think you can play some Desmond Ritter pieces. You can also play New Orleans, Dalton, Olave, Alvin Kamara, you know, over here on the other side. There's some playable and, and some workable stuff here. Um, just have injury concerns to keep an eye out uh, for in, in Pittsburgh. Um, like some one-off pieces from Pittsburgh once again, and really like Najee quite a bit. Not so much on the Carolina side for me, like Pittsburgh's defense as well. Um, a Pittsburgh and a Najee sort of correlation play I think is, is pretty viable. New England and Vegas, I think you can stack uh, pretty much everybody here, and I think New England could be some you know similar to the Tampa pieces we just talked about, some unknown pieces that you could uh, filter in in your late games. Um, not crazy about Arizona and Denver. Uh, once again, just have to keep an eye out for injury stuff like Tennessee and, and the Chargers. I like this game here for some sneaky points. Um, and I like some sneaky stacks for Tampa a little bit. Less so with Cincinnati. Probably prefer, prefer to just stack some Tampa uh, and get exposure to the where I know the, the targets are going, and that's Jamar Chase, and that's in the passing game for the Bucks. So uh, once again, guys, early projections. Um, don't put too much stock in the ownership yet. We'll have uh, updates over the next several days. Once again, sorry that it, it goes so long. Even as we have fewer and fewer games every week, I seem to talk more and more. Um, so that's it. Keep an eye out for those, and uh, yeah, good luck.